I'm Susie Mueller. In this program, we're going to look at the life and work of Michelangelo Buonarroti, a true genius who I consider to be the greatest artist who ever lived. In his lifetime, Michelangelo Buonarroti was called Il Divino, the Divine One. His biographer, Giorgio Vasari, wrote that Michelangelo was the pinnacle of all artistic achievements since the beginning of the Renaissance, excelling in sculpture, painting, and architecture. This was a remarkable achievement, even during the Renaissance, when an educated person was expected to be skilled in many different areas. But Michelangelo's high level of achievement was, and is, unique. Like all professionals, artists tend to specialize. They are either painters or sculptors, architects, printmakers, potters, and so on. A few, such as John Lorenzo Brunini and Pablo Picasso, excelled in any number of different media, but none to the level of Michelangelo, who created not just excellent artworks, but masterpieces, works that are considered among the most outstanding in the history of Western art. Michelangelo was born in 1475 in the small Tuscan hill town of Caprizi, although he was raised in the nearby city of Florence. Amazingly, the house in which he was born still stands. The Buonarrotis were middle class and immensely proud of their aristocratic ancestry. Therefore, Michelangelo's father was outraged when his son announced that he was planning on becoming an artist. Artists were working class. They were not considered gentlemen. They worked with their hands and got dirty. And perhaps even worse, there were no professional art schools where you could go to become an artist. No, you had to serve an apprenticeship under a master. No different from what was required of a plumber or a shoemaker. Well, no, that was the end of it. It was out of the question. No Buonarroti was going to become an artist. And so Michelangelo was enrolled in school, like every other boy his age. He proved to be a less than enthusiastic student and spent much of his time drawing and hanging around in the streets, watching artists at work. Finally, in 1488, as soon as he completed his schooling, Michelangelo's father relented and obtained an apprenticeship for his son with Domenico Ghirlandaio, the foremost fresco painter in Florence. Extremely talented, especially as a portraitist. Ghirlandaio was a hugely successful painter and had a large and prosperous studio with many students and assistants. He was also an excellent teacher who provided Michelangelo with a solid foundation in drawing, painting, and linear perspective. At the time Michelangelo was an apprentice in his studio, Ghirlandaio was working on a major commission for the Tornabuone family in the church of Santa Maria Novella in Florence. A year into his apprenticeship, Michelangelo was given an opportunity that changed his life. Lorenzo de' Medici, the richest, most powerful man in Florence, approached Ghirlandaio and asked him to send two of his most talented apprentices to the Medici Palace. Here they would be enrolled, free of charge, in a new art school just established by Lorenzo. This was a revolutionary concept. Instead of being trained as apprentices, these young men would be students taught by Italy's leading artists and surrounded by scholars and writers as well as the Medici's vast art collection. In the Medici's collection were a large number of antique Greek and Roman sculptures. Michelangelo, who had always dreamed of becoming a sculptor, quickly became the school's leading student, impressing his teachers and Lorenzo himself with his obvious genius. But not everyone was impressed. One day, as the students were drawing in front of Masaccio's frescoes in the Brancacci Chapel, a fellow student, Pietro Torrigiano, got fed up with Michelangelo's bantering, as he called it, and punched him in the nose, breaking it badly. For the rest of his life, Michelangelo obsessed over his broken nose, believing it made him look ugly and disfigured. Michelangelo spent a productive three years living in the Medici Palace and growing as an artist and a scholar. But it was not to last. The political situation in Florence, always volatile even in the best of times, had deteriorated. Lorenzo de' Medici was not a good businessman and much of the Medici fortune had been lost during his years as head of the family. In addition, Savonarola, 
a Dominican friar, began to preach fiery sermons against Lorenzo's lavish and secular lifestyle, calling for the Medici to be expelled and the Florentine Republic reestablished. Then, when in 1492 Lorenzo died and the French invaded Italy, it seemed as if Savonarola's prophecies of doom were coming true. His popularity grew, and soon Florence became a very dangerous place in which to live. Michelangelo, only 17 years old when Lorenzo de' Medici died, returned home. Then he moved to Venice and then to Bologna, where he worked for a year. Finally, he moved to Rome in 1496. He was just 21 years old. In Rome, Michelangelo immediately began receiving large commissions from influential patrons, including for the Bacchus, which shows the god of wine drunk and unsteady on his feet, an unusual interpretation for a classical subject. Then in 1499, he completed his first masterpiece, the Pietà, which is now in St. Peter's Basilica. A Pietà shows the Virgin Mary with the dead body of Christ on her lap. Michelangelo's Pietà was immediately praised, although some thought it could not have been carved by someone so young. The story goes that after overhearing his work attributed to another older artist, Michelangelo carved his name across the Virgin's sash. It is the only work he ever signed. After his huge success in Rome, Michelangelo returned to Florence to sculpt the David for the newly established Florentine Republic. Standing over 14 feet high, this colossal statue became a symbol for Florence a small city that, like the biblical David, stood firm and was victorious over far bigger and more powerful foes. With his slingshot at the ready, David scans the horizon with wary eyes, looking for Goliath, much as the government of Florence stood vigilant against men such as the Medici who would take away their freedom. This sculpture, one of the most famous in the world, sealed Michelangelo's reputation as the greatest sculptor of the High Renaissance. And now what you've been waiting for, the Sistine Chapel. In 1505, Michelangelo was summoned to Rome and commissioned to design and build the tomb of Pope Julius II. As he always did, Michelangelo approached the project with great enthusiasm, designing a colossal structure with 40 huge sculptures. But funds were diverted to other projects, and the work was constantly being delayed. In the end, Michelangelo worked on what he termed the tragedy of the tomb off and on for 40 years. Perhaps the best known sculpture from the tomb of Julius II is the Moses, whose facial features are said to have inspired the casting of Charlton Heston as Moses in the 1950s epic movie The Ten Commandments. Charlton Heston also played the role of Michelangelo himself in another epic film, The Agony and the Ecstasy. This movie is about the painting of the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Michelangelo was taken off the tomb project in 1508 to begin work on the Sistine ceiling. Since he had not worked in fresco since 1489 when he was apprenticed to Ghirlandaio, he was very reluctant. But once he signed the contract, he presented the Pope with an ambitious composition that included over 340 figures. The frescoes depict scenes from the Old Testament and symbolize humanity's need for God's salvation. Painted in vivid colors and defined outlines, to make them easily visible from the floor, the viewer is drawn to the creation of Adam near the center of the composition. Another masterpiece, Michelangelo shows God the Father just as he is about to give the spark of life to Adam. These are huge figures, and thanks to an extensive restoration project that was completed in 1989, the frescoes glow with the same rich intensity that Michelangelo intended. Michelangelo was 37 when he completed the ceiling, still young and optimistic. However, 24 years later, when he was 61, and Pope Paul III called him back to paint a last judgment on the altar wall, Michelangelo had changed. Now bitter and angry, despondent over his personal life, and deeply concerned about upheavals in the Catholic Church brought about by the Protestant Reformation, his last judgment presents a hellish vision of the second coming of Christ. With more emphasis on the damned than on the saved, Michelangelo has filled his composition with writhing nude figures that scream out in terror and agony. And he has included himself among those condemned to hell. 
Nonetheless, in 1547, Michelangelo, now 72, redesigned the dome of St. Peter's Basilica in a way that evokes the power and majesty of God through a sense of miraculous light that streams through the windows and draws the viewer's eyes and thoughts towards heaven. Called the greatest creation of the Renaissance, the Dome of St. Peter's is one of Michelangelo's finest achievements. For the 10-Minute Professor, this is Susan Ray Euler. Thanks for tuning in, and make sure you watch our next program.